So I start, I'll start, I do have one question for you. So uh, as, as Dr. Martins mentioned, the response rate with these immunotherapies aren't as uh, robust as, uh, as we may have thought they could have been, sometimes as low as 30 or 40 percent. And, uh, and further, when, you know, sometimes we see patients who've got progression disease on imaging, but they still clinically look very well on these drugs. So how do you follow these patients, and how do you really determine whether they are progressing? Uh, you know, when do you switch them off of immunotherapy? How do you do that with your patients? So I would say that uh, if patients are doing well, symptomatically improving, the progression is fairly modest. Radiographically, I would continue therapy as long as it is not affecting a critical organ or there is no mass effect. Having said that, the incidence of pseudo-progression, uh, as uh, was initially uh, reported in the, initially in the melanoma literature, is probably not uh, that high in lung cancer as in melanoma. Most of those progressions are probably real. Just like targeted therapies, we don't change patients. We don't change therapy right away when patients have some increase in uh, some of these lesions. So I would continue to watch them, uh, especially if the clinical, uh, clinical improvement is quite striking, uh, I would be very hesitant to change therapy over one CT scan alone. On the other hand, if you see serially the CT scan shows progressive worsening, um, uh, then I think at some point we may have to change therapy. Can I just uh, describe a case that I had uh, this week? And obviously, I want to be careful here not to advocate doing things because I saw somebody. Uh, uh, that, that's not the point. Uh, I think hopefully when you hear what happened with this patient, it would just make you pause and think, what is the exact mechanism by which immunotherapy uh, works or stops working for that matter? So we had this patient that was in an immunotherapy trial with a pd one uh, antibody uh, and a CTLA-4 antibody, and he was just cruising along, doing fantastic. Um, he was very symptomatic when he first presented. He got treated in first, in second line, and uh, um, his shortness of breath went away. You know, he felt so much better, gained weight, became more active, and then about a year into treatment, he developed a right axillary lymph node. That trial, contrary of many trials of immunotherapy, that did not allow for the continuation of therapy uh, once the patient had evidence of disease progression. So we did a biopsy of the lymph node because I want to make sure that I knew what I was dealing with. Plus, we have a protocol of rebiopsying patients uh, at the time of disease progression on uh, immunotherapy. And it showed the same thing. You had an adenocarcinoma that was growing that area. The lymph node get, got progressively bigger up to about three and a half centimeters. It was the only site of disease. He had to come out of the study. And, uh, you know, we were talking about should we radiate this area? Is the only site? And he's like, oh, is that going to make me live longer? I said, you know, I don't know. Uh, and then he developed some mild discomfort over the axillary area. And I said, you know, you probably should radiate this. And he lives three hours from us, so he contacted a radiation oncologist closer to home. And when he was about to start, he decided that he didn't want to do it. I saw him this week. He just came back from Machu Picchu, uh, where he went hiking with his son. And the lymph node is about half of the size that it was uh, the last time I saw him. And I have no idea why that is. Uh, you know, is it because, as Govinda mentioned, um, is it possible that uh, that clone had dropped the antigen that the immune system was recognizing at the time, but then over time the immune system was able to recognize that antigen again, and that's what led to this new response to treatment that he stopped a while ago, you know, who knows? You know, obviously we're never going to know. I just want to make the point that there were two abstracts at ASCO this year indicating that chemotherapy after immunotherapy seems to be more effective than you would expect those same, same chemotherapies to be in comparable lines of treatment, raising the question that perhaps exposure to immunotherapy may change the natural history to other treatments. 
that case actually made me pause and think, well, is it really the next chemo that you get or is some delayed effect of the immunotherapy that the patient received? And I guess we don't know the answer to that. Thank you very much. So that was incredibly long. For brain metastasis from non-small cell lung cancer, would you use uh, immunotherapy? Um, you know, there are obviously um, uh, reports of uh, um, response to it, and I would use the same guidelines that I, I would use to treat uh, any brain metastasis. You know, if they are really symptomatic, then they should have that treated. If they are asymptomatic, then you follow them closely. This may be less about the uh, CNS penetration of the molecules themselves and some priming of the immune system overall. So, you know, no, I don't. Um, I'm sure that there is, uh, but I'm not sure if that is. I have another question. In the, the new NCCN guidelines, they recommend molecular testing, EG, even EGFR, for squamous cell cancers as well. Without a but that's significant most exactly. So we, we, do you know what, what the frequency is in, in those patients for those mutations? Well, it, it depends on uh, how, how good uh, the pathology is. Um, here's my theory. Uh, my theory is that uh, these, uh, and you know, the case I discussed had two pathology labs, the outside and confirmed at the University of Washington calling squamous cell. You know, this is one of those things, uh, as I explained to my patients. You know, the fact that uh, you uh, is six foot four, blonde, uh, blue eyes, and speak uh, Swedish doesn't mean that you're from Sweden. You could be from Minnesota, too. Uh, so, you know, are, are those really squamous cell carcinomas? You know, they may look like squamous cell carcinomas, but certainly they don't behave as squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, they definitely should be tested. Are there any other questions?